Hello, folks. Cool. Hello. All right. Welcome, everybody, to the uh, February community meeting. And I believe this is the first one in the new year. Yes, it is. Cool. So happy new year, uh, even though it's a little late. Uh, thanks for joining. We have two talks today. Uh, one, one, one talk is from Nirav, who's talking about um, his work at Experian and how he's uh, integrating Amundsen with OIDC. Uh, and we'll, we'll have the first talk on that. And the second talk is from Allison at Lyft, who's going to be talking about automating Amundsen releases. Um, and we'll have some time towards the end for questions and open floor. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. So, um, okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Allison. I am in the Amundsen team at Lyft, and I've been working in the past couple of weeks in getting automated releases uh, for all libraries in Amundsen. This is important because not only for our community, uh, so you can get the most up to date. Um, versions of our libraries without having to wait for someone to decide to create a new release uh, from the committer side. Um, but yeah, so it makes it easier for us as people working uh, with Amundsen uh, and building features for Amundsen to get releases out um, periodically without having to manually create the um, log uh, with the diff and having to bump the version and do all that manually. And, but it also helps you get up-to-date consistent releases and be able to know exactly when you're gonna have a new version uh, to uh, update to. So I think it makes it easier for everyone. Um, so in order to do this, what I did was create a new GitHub action. Uh, and I started with the front end uh, library, but now this should be in front end data builder uh, Amundsen in common, um, search, and I might be missing one. We'll figure it out. Later. <laughs> but yeah, so let me walk you through what we did. So right now, if you go to actions, you will be able to see a monthly release action. And you can see that I've ran this many times to try to test it out. But basically, if we look at the steps of the action, we'll see that first it checks out uh, the newest code, and then it uses Python semantic release, which is a third party action. And what this um, uh, action does is it looks at the diff and the new commits. It figures out what version uh, should be bumped. So minor, major, patch. Um, it does an auto update on the setup.py file. Uh, so you can see here, it says it's creating a new version tells you the current version, and then in this case, it bumped to, uh, the minor version to four. And then after that is done, um, sadly, we were not able to get a fully automated process. So we do have to create a pull request. That pull request then needs to be uh, accept, uh, approved by um, a someone who has the permission to approve it, and then after that is approved, then we trigger a separate action, uh, which is the publish monthly release action. And this action, if you take a look here, basically detects when both the setup.py file where the version bump happens and the change log file are both changed, which indicates that the um, semantic release action has been triggered and everything has been updated. So then this PR, uh, this action is like, okay, a PR has been merged that changed these two files. So let me um, check out the code, um, get the latest version. And this is just so uh, we can know what version we're currently in. Um, it creates a new release, which is what you see on GitHub. It uh, adds the wheel dependency, generates the disk files, and then publish those to PyPy. And yeah, the job is completed at that point. And we have a new version that people can then access. And so I can show you a little demo of how this would work. Basically, it happens, it, it all happens really quickly. So 
you have the monthly release action. In this case, I am able to trigger it manually, and this was mostly for testing purposes, but this should run uh, the first day of every single month um, at like midnight. So you should expect a new release the first day of every single month uh, at midnight. So then if we run the workflow, it'll take a couple seconds, probably like 30, 40 seconds. Um, and this will do everything that I mentioned before. It will take semantic release. It will look at the newest uh, commits and it will say, okay, we have a new version and this is the bump that we're gonna make. Um, so yeah, that should take a couple of seconds. Mm. Cool. While, while we wait for that, um, can you wanna take a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, so Madison is asking, does the semantic release determine whether to bump the major or minor version automatically? Yeah, it does. And so we can obviously like kind of disagree or agree with that decision by looking at the PR and saying, oh, they bumped in, let's say, a major where we really didn't introduce anything that required it. I haven't seen any issues. It seems pretty accurate in the way that it uh, bumps the versions. I'm not entirely sure how the inner workings of the action work. Um, but yeah, we would be like, it does do it automatically, but we would be able to say, yes, this is, we think this is correct, or no, we don't think this is correct, and make changes accordingly. Um, so now it should have ran. Yeah, so you can see now that there's a new pull request. Um, and you can see that in this case, it decided to bump the minor version. And let's just say, okay, cool. Um, all the checks have passed, so it did. Uh, the DCO and it did the title as you can see here and then let's just approve this squash and merge confirm and now it's gonna trigger the other action that I talked about earlier and you can see it You can see it right here that it already detected that the two files were changed, the change log and the setup file. And so it's just gonna publish the new release in also um, probably a couple of minutes. And then we will be able to see it in the releases side of things. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. Oh, it also like automates the diff like description. So that was a, another thing that was a huge pain point because if you go down and see, for instance, this, this had to be done manually before, which was just um, a lot of work. So I'm really glad that we have something that generates that for us as well. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Yeah, Plush, Plush asked a question. Is there any filtering technique to reject unstable fixes or features that happened very recently and mark, are now marked with relevant GitHub tags? So I guess like, the fact that we have to do a PR that has to be approved is kind of that filter step, right? So like if it's trying to do an automatic release, but we know that there's something that like shouldn't be uh, released just yet, but has been merged for some reason, which we try to be pretty good about like maintaining everything uh, kind of aligned and not introduce breaking changes without making an announcement for the community. Um, that wouldn't be released until someone approves it. So it would kind of prevent that in my opinion. Thank you. I have another question. I presume the actions can only be triggered by the maintainers on the project, not by anybody else? I believe that that's the case, but uh, I need to double check that. Um, and we could just get rid of um, manual triggering of actions altogether and have people do what we did before, which was um, you go in, you like if, if you wanted to do a manual release, you could still do that by updating the setup file, like bumping the version, creating a new tag on the releases tab, and then uh, that would trigger a publishing of the release. So um, I could just disable the manual of uh, like triggering of uh, the way that I just did it through the actions tab altogether. Um, that was just more for testing and demoing purposes, uh, at least at first. Yeah, that is confirmed that. She can kick off a new release. Um, I have another question. How do you think about this monthly release cadence versus doing it when we feel like there's enough uh, volume of features or enough 
uh, value in features and bundling them together and then triggering that release? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I've noticed that, for instance, we have some libraries that are updated very frequently, and that goes everything from like new features to very small fixes. Uh, let's say in UI for a month in front of it, right? Like that's one of the ones where we get like the most merged code just all the time. For other libraries, it might be less necessary. Um, so I think that I right now they're set up at the same cadence, but of course, if we find that it would be more beneficial, for instance, to do one every quarter for, let's say, search or common, um, we could do that. And if there is a major feature that needs to be put out as soon as possible, we still have the option to do a manual release. So um, I think that either way, we, we, we can tailor this as we go to figure out what works best for us. Right now, it's just set to something standard, so we can kind of test and figure out what's best for the community. That makes sense. I, I have a question. So digging into the cadence question, can it be based not on the time, but amount of new merge requests? There were like every five new merge requests, we release a version. I would have to look into it. Um, cause the, the GitHub actions can be kind of limiting on how they allow you to like trigger an action. Um, I don't know if they have anything based on like the count of merges. And I also think that it's worth like kind of noting that like every, everything you merge is differently. So like in front end, I would get to five so quickly, <laughs> like it would take like maybe a day. So we would have new releases every day, which is not necessarily practical, but I could look into how we can get at least for certain libraries, it might make sense to use a um, number of things merged. But I think if, since we have the, um, the prefix for things, like if we had, let's say five features merged, that would be different than like five fixes or chores or something like that. So that might also be worth looking into, worth looking into, sorry. And another one was uh, like the Pal Palash mentioned that you actually there might be like edge cases when on master there is something that is quite unstable. So I like the part where, where you need to actually approve the, the release. Uh, but it, does it mean that if the pull request was created to um, actually release, it means that we cannot uh, add any new code before the release or is it possible still to do it? You definitely can. Yeah, it's a normal pull request, right? Uh, it, okay. What it does is bumps the setup. Uh, Okay. Out of life, like overwrites the change log to have the new log so that we can pull that for the uh, GitHub release. But yeah, you can you could add any other code along with that. And as long as the uh, publish action detects that there's been a change in setup and change log, okay. you trigger the uh, publishing. So it should be. So, th so that could be considered that safety vessel. Like we know that something is unstable and there is an automated, automated action, but we still can somehow influence this if it's released and add the patch if it's necessary, like the critical patch before releasing, right? Yep. Cool. Thanks. No problem. Um, any other questions for Allison? Um, Jorn is saying having the monthly as a base and then manually the ability to trigger when more important stuff lands is, is a pretty good starting point. Uh, Doreen, go ahead and ask your question. I, I just want to say thank you. This is going to save a lot of people a lot of time. It's really excellent. Yeah, I agree. Hi, Dorian. And yeah, for especially for just because I, I do see, uh, I saw a lot of times in the uh, Slack channel, people would be like, hey, like, when is the new release coming? Or I don't have these new things and I'm having errors with this thing because it was fixed like later on, but no one had the time to create a new release. So I think this is gonna get everyone in a way better pace. Uh, I'm very thankful for open source too, because I'm, I'm almost certainly gonna steal this. So thank you <laughs> for sharing, <laughs> yeah, this is no very problem. cool. Yeah, yeah, it, it's really useful and very transferable. Uh, it did take a while to figure out, but it, I didn't even realize we could do stuff like this. <laughs> awesome, last call. Cool, this is great, Allison, thank you. I know a lot of users have been asking for this fixed list as well. So the fact that we're automating, it helps a lot of the folks deploying the months into. Oh.
Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. All right, next up is Nirav. He's going to talk about authentication with Key Clock and Okta. I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Uh, hi, all. I'm Nirav here. Uh, so currently, I'm working at ESM and um, we are uh, working with the Experian to set it out uh, as a, a data catalog uh, at Experian. Uh, so uh, we have started this project as a part of uh, uh, the small POC and then it turned out that uh, we are going ahead with the, uh, the Amundsen and uh, uh, as of now we have completed our first MVP. And uh, within the, the first ask was to set it out the authentication as well. So I will just try to share some of the uh, some of the, my experience uh, with uh, setting it out uh, the authentication um, uh, with Amundsen. So, um, I think uh, that the doc documentation is uh, is is a quite uh, uh, formatted. Uh, also, it 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 put it out the information about uh, uh, how to uh, install the Flask OIDC. Uh, so, the so the first of all, uh, when we are uh, setting it out, uh, the the Amundsen Amundsen is is not uh, by default uh, uh, mitigation uh, available. So we require to set it out uh, the environmental variable if we are uh, uh, running uh, the process uh, uh, without Docker. Uh, but if we are using with Docker, we can define those uh, variables within a Docker file. But at Experian, we are uh, not using the Docker because uh, the team does not have a uh, 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 the team doesn't know the Docker much. So we are setting it out uh, the, all the environment variable over there over here. So, uh, in that first, I will uh, you know go to the uh, key clock. How uh, I integrated the key clock uh, around during my POC. Uh, so, in a key clock, uh, if you see, uh, it's a it's again it's a uh, um, it's 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 a, it's a free product. Um, uh, so, uh, you can have set it out a key clock by just uh, uh, running running the Docker image. And uh, I think uh, uh, the, the the starter guide it, it's it's uh, uh, pretty much simple. Uh, we can just start the key clock and uh, uh, then set it out uh, uh, realm as well as we can create it out a user. So over here, I already created the uh, key clock. So I will just uh, okay. So in a in a realm. Uh, we can create a different uh, level of realm. So here I am just using the master realm uh, for uh, this demo, but we can create it out a diff different realm as well. So to use a key clock, what we need to do is first we to register our application. So the, for the registering our application, uh, we need the client and uh, we can create a uh, application over here, right? And uh, over here, we need to provide our application ID. Uh, uh, we need to provide uh, the client protocol. So as we uh, the uh, the current method is supporting the OID, uh, uh, OIDC, so we need to do the open ID connect. Uh, uh, so I have already created uh, one application over here. So I just gave the name as Amundsen Frontend. And if we look it over here, so the, in a key, key clock, uh, the what are the parameters we need to keep in mind while setting it out? Uh, we need to set it out uh, the valid re uh, redirect URL and uh, the base URL. Um, so as of now, uh, in the, uh, I'm just running on my local machine. So I just kept it out a local host uh, and uh, the port is the 5000. So you can see that uh, in a redirect URL, uh, I, we, are, we are going to accept uh, all those uh, uh, um, we, we are going to accept the uh, all, all those requests. So we, we are going to keep it just uh, the extra over here. And uh, the, uh, in a protocol and access type, we need to keep the open ID and the protocol, we need to select it out a uh, confidential. If we are going to keep it out a uh, public, uh, uh, there would be no authentication. And once we are going to select out a uh, confidential and uh, save this application, 
it will give you the credentials over here as well. So here you are going to get, uh, uh, so this secret and uh, the client ID. So these are the two information we require to store it into the, our client secret file. Uh, so uh, once we, once these two informations are available, uh, we can create a client secret file, uh, which would look something like this. So I'm going to stop the, the currently. Uh, yeah. Uh, so here uh, we can define uh, the issuer, the issuer admin, uh, the authentication URI and uh, the client ID and a client secret. So these informations you are going to get it uh, after uh, uh, saving your applications uh, into the key clock. Uh, and into the redirect uh, URI, you need to uh, put it out uh, the, the, the same port information. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, going to be same as what you are going to define it into the key clock, uh, where um, into the uh, valid redirect URI. Uh, so once you're going to uh, create your uh, client secrets key clock file, uh, we need to set it out uh, the environment variable. Uh, so it is going to be uh, in the same order what we defined over here. So uh, we need to put it uh, uh, put it out the information for the front end library. What would my app wrapper, uh, the app class, uh, and uh, what is going to be my Flask module name and the Flask uh, class name, app class name. So these are the variables um, I've already implemented uh, into the um, uh, post. So I'm going to, uh, so here I have, let me just, uh, uh, so uh, the app wrapper and the app wrapper class is, equal, is my flas uh, OIDC. So this is the same model which we have, uh, which which is which which we are going to install uh, as per the instruction. So this instruction is already given over here uh, to redirect you to uh, uh, this flask OIDC. And uh, we have a Vardan uh, as well um, over here. So he has developed uh, the flask OIDC uh, wrapper. Uh, and uh, once we are going to define over here, uh, and uh, over here we are going to set it out. Uh, 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 so, so once um, the key clock is uh, my application is being uh, registered, and I have put it out uh, this environmental variable, the key clock is going to provide me uh, the authentication token. So over here we are defining that where my authentication is token is going to be stored. So in this case we are storing it uh, into the SQL light. And uh, for that, uh, I, we are putting it out, the session type is equal to SQL Alchemy. Um, and uh, here we are trying to uh, do the uh, whitelisting the endpoints. Um, and uh, here I'm kind of, you know, just putting it out uh, the path where my client secret file is being stored. Uh, yeah, so, so once these are the informations are being uh, set it out, uh, we can go ahead and uh, start our application. So. I'm going to start the application. And once we are going to start the application, we can see that my application is being started with uh, the configuration with the OIDC config uh, uh, class. So which tells me that it is going to uh, invoke the uh, OIDC authentication while I'm going to do the logon. So if I'm going to just log on over here. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, so now it is uh, asking me the, the username and password. And uh, uh, before uh, if, um, I'm, I will go on to the logon, I need to define my user as well over here. So as of now, I have set it out to my user uh, and setting up the user is also pretty much uh, straightforward. Uh, so you need to just put it out the username, uh, the email ID, first name and last name. Uh, once we are going to put it out, so let's say if I'm going to uh, just create a one user. Yeah. Uh, so my user is set now and I just need to set it out a credential for it. So 
let's say I'm going to do the So here I have just set it out uh, the temporary credential. So when the user is going to do the log on the first time, um, the key clock is uh, for the password change. Yeah. Out a new password. Okay. Once uh, the the user is being added, you can see the feature uh, as like the bookmarks. And you can see the profile uh, once the the user is being set it out, right? Uh, so this is how you can uh, set it out. Man, did we lose Nira? <laughs> Looks like we did. Um, I wanted to see if uh, there are other people on the call who have experience with um, OIDC and key clock. So if anybody has questions while Nira comes back, um, feel free to raise your hand or uh, put them in the chat. Yeah, I'm um, sorry guys, I, I think I lost my internet connectivity. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, currently we, uh, you know, uh, with uh, our default, uh, 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 the Amundsen code does not have a logout button. Uh, so your user is going to be logged on, uh, is going to expire. So you need to wait for it. Um, Can you share your screen again? Similarly for the, I apologize. Yeah, are you, uh, are you able to see now? Yep. Uh, hey, Mark, are you are you able to see it? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, uh, similarly to the Okta, uh, so in Okta, uh, also it is uh, uh, you know like means there is a well-defined document uh, is already put it out over here um, the how to set it uh, uh, the octa uh, yeah if I am correct uh, so yeah so you can register your application uh, using the octa so uh, the steps are already provided over here uh, so we we can go to the link and and just go through it but if if I just go to the quickly on onto the Okta uh, integration is uh, the similar to the key clock uh, we require to uh, register our application. Uh, so once we are going to uh, so so in in application we can go to the add application and uh, there uh, we need to put it out uh, the our application as a web application and uh, once you select the web. It will ask us uh, what would be the name of the application, what is going to be my base URL, uh, and uh, uh, redirect uh, URI, right? So these informations uh, it is going to uh, ask, and once we are going to uh, registration, uh, it is going to create uh, the uh, client secret as well as the client ID. So if I go to the application and just check that. Okay, so in this application, uh, over here, I uh, if you see, uh, I can uh, I can have my client ID as well as the client secret. So these informations I need to set it out in my uh, client secret file. Uh, so uh, if I'm going to open my client secret file. Yeah. 
So over here, I need to put it out my client ID and my uh, client secret. Um, and similarly, I just need to put it out uh, my redirect URI as well. Uh, in a redirect URI, if you see, uh, if we are using the Okta, uh, the, the difference is I need to put it out the authorization uh, code slash callback. So this is what we need to set it out uh, if we are trying to uh, have the authorization via Okta in this case. Uh, and apart from that, uh, we also need to put it out, set it out. These are the variables as well. Uh, so uh, in a, uh, in my uh, uh, YDC callback route, I need to put it out the authorization code slash callback. So once we do that, this, then only the Okta is going to work. Um, and uh, if I'm going to start my application over here, here Right, uh, so yeah, this is running Okta and uh, uh, if I'm going to, yeah, I will just open up the, yeah, so in case of the Okta, it's uh, pretty much uh, the, the same. Only the few of the parameters we require to change. Yeah, so you can, you can see over here. Uh, yeah, so the profile is kind of you know getting loaded. Um, yeah, so while it is getting loaded, uh, yeah, if, if there is any question, probably we can discuss those as well. Marius, do you want to ask your question? Yes, so I have a question regarding the idle session timer because we actually uh, recently been facing some issues with uh, Amundsen not doing well with idle timeouts. So let's say you leave Amundsen uh, um, and do not do anything for 30 minutes. I guess it's a default value in key clock. It uh, renders an error when you try to make a an request and we were looking into ways to mitigate that. So the question is, have you faced that as well? And if so, uh, how did you deal with it? So, uh, so basically, uh, you know, like currently this project uh, is into the MVP only. So we are, uh, we haven't uh, put it out of more focus on to the, the authentication. Uh, so, so we haven't, uh, you know, worked upon the, like, you know, uh, after how many seconds uh, the, uh, the session is getting timed. But if I'm, I'm correct, I think uh, the, uh, the timeout uh, uh, is probably is getting configured somewhere over here. Uh, so if I think the timeout uh, is, is is being configured, uh, you, you you can configure within uh, Flask OIDC itself. Okay, thanks. Cool. Those are all the questions for now. Thank you. Cool. Any other questions for Nirav? Any comments, anything someone wants to add? All right, then it's, uh, thank you, Nirav. Anything else from you, Nirav? Um, uh, no, and uh, uh, the, just, just uh, you know, the, the separate note, uh, we are trying to add it out uh, the Kafka layer as well, uh, along with the Amundsen. So what we are trying to build it out in Experian is uh, uh, because we have a kind of uh, uh, 
the pool based model in amundsen uh, so we are just trying to create out uh, uh, the push based model where we are going to uh, pull it out the data from the different data sources using the kafka connect and uh, then directly we are going to uh, ingest into the uh, in, in in our uh, meta store as well as in elastic search so uh, let's say the data is moving from the neo 4j to the elastic search uh, in terms of uh, the csv files we are also trying to eliminate it and uh, putting it out uh, kafka in between cool that that sounds really good um yeah keep us posted and uh, would love to hear how that goes i have a question regarding that one <clears throat> so are you are you trying to build this whole thing inside dimension or are you planning to upstream this thing uh or is this a is this a company only thing how are you how are you trying to implement this whole thing uh so uh, we are first of all we are planning to open source uh uh, but uh, as of now, you know, like I mean, so because this is going to be first initiative for Experian to make it open source. So we are trying to uh, working on onto the logistic as well as uh, uh, checking with the HR how we could do it. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, we are trying to build around Amundsen. So we are not going to make a, any changes within Amundsen. Uh, so let's say uh, the 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 very first thing we what we are implementing is. Uh, just ingesting the data uh, from the any data sources to the Kafka top. And uh, if I talk about uh, our, our, our sample codes, what, what uh, the example codes, what, uh, what is being provided. So if we, if you see in that code, uh, we have it, uh, the data reading from the, uh, let's say the high, high meta store or to the MySQL uh, tape, uh, a schema and then we are uh, ingesting to the new 4j so we have modified those code and rather than directly connecting to the mysql or uh, to the high meta store we are reading it from the kafka topic and then ingesting into the new 4j mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you are trying to skip them and send data builder over there not completely not not uh, not, not completely because uh, the data builder is still there uh, but uh, rather than uh, directly hitting to the any of the uh, data source, we are just hitting it to the Kafka topics. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, sounds cool. Yeah, I'm just curious how big is your team working on MNC and from Experian? Uh, so currently we have uh, uh, the, the three people. So two, two is from the, uh, uh, they are kind of focusing on to the development side and uh, uh, the team member uh, is uh, focusing on to the more on the DevOps and the SRE. Sounds cool, man. Thank you so much. That's all from my end. Cool. Uh, Madison, you had a question and comment? Yeah, I, I wonder if this relates. I haven't gotten into any of the actual authentication side of Amundsen's front end, uh, but I know that my organization uses Auth0 as their um, authentication client. Um, does that have integration with um, the key cloak or um, like Flask OIDC? Does anyone know? That's totally fine if not, just curious. Sorry, can you repeat your question? My, my organization uses Auth0 um, as their authorization client or their authorization product, I guess. Um, and I'm wondering if that has, if anyone knows of the ability to integrate that with a Munson, um, or to, or if that like can interact with Keycloak or the Flask uh, OIDC. I don't have a, a direct answer to that, um, but I can share some insights. Like initially in Rapido, we started using Amundsen with Google uh, OAuth 2. But later we started using Keycloak and like Keycloak is being a identity broker here where like we are ultimately getting logged in via Google but via Keycloak, Keycloak is the middle person here. So I think Auth0, if like they are uh, supporting standard YDC uh, protocol, like uh, that is YDC 1.0, then you can just add Auth0 on Keycloak uh, website. Uh, Keycloak already has templates for GitHub, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, 
uh, Google, lots of standard social media connectors. Uh, if it is not there, then you can also connect using standard SAML or uh, OpenID connections. And then remaining is uh, as uh, Nirav has already focused uh, that type of uh, integration you can do with Geeklook. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I hope that helps. Cool. Any other questions for Nirav? All right, thank you, Nero. We know it's especially late for you. It's almost 11 p.m. It's past 11 uh, yeah. for you. So appreciate you taking the time and sharing with us. Yeah, thank you. Cool, so next is open floor. We wanted to see if there are folks who had general questions or feedback on the project um, or any topics that you would specifically like to talk about today or in the next meeting. We'd love to hear your thoughts and feedback. So um, uh, in an experience, apart from the Kafka, we are uh, trying to build the persistent layer as well uh, for the auditing and the data versioning. And uh, I do see, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, the, the same thing is also started as a PR. Uh, so do we have any any plan to, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the fully functioning, uh, functioning uh, uh, the features uh, around it? I'm actually not super on top of that PR. I'm wondering if there's anyone else who knows about that PR on top of their head. So I, I the, the question uh, is around the persistence of, of, of what exactly? Yes. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, uh, we, we have it uh, another, another uh, uh, the full well about uh, is uh, Amundsen RDS. Yeah. So yeah, so in an experience also we are we are we have started uh, uh, building it out uh, the, the the similar thing because we we want to create it out uh, uh, the the RDS layer which can do the versioning and the data auditing uh, before we push the data to the Neo four J. So yeah, so I think I, I think the current proposal is a little bit of a weaker form than that. It it is. Uh, a straight up replacement of of Neo4j with with the relational database, uh, so it doesn't have the stronger guarantees of having different versions, which I think is is um, uh, a, a different a, a pretty different animal. So I, I would engage in an RFC. I would hope that the way that it's being structured, um, it doesn't preclude the ability to include that kind of functionality in the future. Obviously, like tons of benefits to having that source of truth with versions rather than a uh, point in time snapshot, but that's not in scope right now. Okay. Cool. Any other comments or general thoughts? But they're like, it's still very uh, injected. Going once, twice, and it's a wrap. Thank you everyone for joining. We'll see you next month and I'll follow up with the links to the recording uh, on Slack. Appreciate your time and presentations, Allison and Nira. Thanks so much. Thanks again Thank for you. sending us up. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye.